So it's been an amazing morning. You've seen a lot of the technologies that we've been building across Esri in Redlands and all of our different development centers. But something we heard from you is the desire to actually learn a little bit more about what we're looking forward to. What are we exploring? What are things that are not, not quite ready to be in production, but might be something you'd want to know more about? So we perform extensive research across all of the products that we build and deliver. But it's interesting being here at, the, at this session, as well as across the world, sharing ideas and concepts, coming up with new ideas and innovations, and then building those into prototypes. We try out these ideas, and we work closely with other customers to validate these concepts. Really good prototypes turn into beta products in which we give certain customers access to give us feedback on that. And when it's high enough quality, it ships as a production code. Now, the reason we want to share this with you, with you is to inspire your own work, things that you can do to solve complex problems lever leveraging the ArcGIS platform. Inspired by Cameron Beccario, we wanted to explore how we could visualize wind data globally. And this was taken by one of our development partners to a customer in order to visualize satellite-identified fires and how the wind carries the smoke across international borders in order, and affects air quality and health of other countries. So an example of idea of research being applied to customers. Now, a lot of technology goes through uh, uh, various cycles of adoption. As we've seen numerous paradigm shifts over the past few decades, sometimes where new technology comes out and it has this high expectation of transforming the way we work. But it doesn't happen right away. I know personally, I got my first virtual reality headset in 1996, and it was awesome. 640 by 480 pixel resolution, it was great. But it's now taken 20 years for that to kind of really emerge as something we might actually do real work with. And so our responsibility is to explore these technologies, identify when and how they can be used, and then share that, uh, what we've learned with you in terms of how it can apply to your work when it's ready to be used in production. So we're looking about this technology spectrum and how that keeps expanding out as new technology comes forth. New ways to capture data from microsats in terms of imaging the Earth multiple times a day robots and aerial drones, which are deployed on demand in the field to capture data about LIDAR and imagery and be able to use to make decisions. New ways to crowdsource data, both through explicit sensors, but also implicit and IoT technology to constantly get data that we can act on. Now, with these high-velocity, real-time streams of heterogeneous data, we have to think about new ways to extend our analytics to understand these. So we're exploring things like machine learning and semantic ontologies. And finally, it has to get in the hands of people to do something with whether it's through explorable analytics in new interfaces, augmented reality and virtual reality, even wearable devices that we might wear on our wrists or on our glasses or on our bodies, and also voice recognition for ubiquitous pervasive access to this information. So William Gibson famously said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So from Redlands to all of our global R&D centers, we're working closely alongside customers to identify and explore that future. And then when we discover that, how do we deploy that to all of you? So I want to share a few of the products that we're doing that's relevant, maybe ways you might start exploring this yourself. So you heard from the Portland Maine team all the exciting stuff they're doing with, with runtime and mobile tools. They're exploring new ways to actually have office workers ping their remote uh, field workers in terms of understanding where they are. If they've been offline for a while, can I just fetch their location to understand where they are? But even more interestingly is they have passive sensors in my phone. Did the person fall? Were they in an accident? Is this something that actually might need to alert me? I could put this into a, a bicycle application and actually measure bicycle um, accelerometer to understand where my roads might need to be resurfaced due to uh, degradation over time. Melbourne, Australia is looking about how we actually layer information on the world in front of us. You saw a little bit about this earlier, but they actually started exploring about how you can take the GIS and annotate the world in front of you, the buildings, the facilities, the traffic, the real-time data. As the team puts it, it's a Pokemon for GIS, to put it lightly. But the idea is we can actually start seeing real-time information on the real world and how, how they are interacted, this digital twin visualized. Zurich and Redlands have been exploring how we can actually bring virtual reality to your work. What's really interesting about virtual reality is not just seeing places that you're not at, but seeing places that do not yet exist. It's about uh, providing tools to urban planners to tr try out an intersection or a new park, and they can walk through it. They can have citizens walk through that park and explore and annotate and feed back on that. So using virtual reality for better, more efficient planning exercises. Now, in Washington, DC, one of the things we're working extensively on is a hub. And a hub is really focused around how government can provide services to citizens to ask questions of their community and their environment and provide feedback. So we're looking about how do, how do millions of people who are not familiar with GIS yet actually collaborate and use the GIS through ubiquitous interfaces. And we're doing that through exploring other new technologies from other partners as well. 
Amazon, for example, has a very good interfaces in terms of Lambda and API gateways to proxy interfaces to other third-party services, all powered by the ArcGIS platform and the APIs you've seen all morning, but new interfaces that have not yet existed. To demo this, I want to show you a new project we're working on called Sonar. So the District of Columbia has a really great open data site. I can come and search for transit data and crime data. I can download this and access this through APIs. But the average citizen isn't really thinking about APIs. They're thinking about asking questions of, of their environment. So in Esri, and a lot of you probably use Slack as a, as a chat system. So I can ask very simple questions, like Sonar. Tell me about trash at oops, 201 4th Street, Northeast. So I'm going to ask about at my house. Sonar actually goes and talks to that, that backend service and tells me when trash is. It's Monday and Thursday. So it's a, a simple way of asking questions of it. But now, Slack's a pretty technical interface. What's a much more common one is Facebook. So there's now an integration of Facebook in which I can send messages to it. And I can say things like um, safety of that same neighborhood. So there were two crimes nearby in the past month, stay safe, by accessing the government services. Now, what's also really cool about Facebook is there's a mobile application. So I can actually go, and while I'm traveling around, walking around with my kids, I can ask questions, for example, like, let's pull this up. Where are the bus stops at Stanton Park? It actually tells me where the nearest bus stop is and actually the walking directions to that. So now any citizens out exploring the city with their kids can ask simple questions and get back information. Now that's great, this is still using interfaces, but I want to talk to the city. I want to hear from the city. So Amazon has now shipped 11 million Echo devices. Google now has voice control. How do we actually have non-invasive interfaces to data? So I want to demo this, but typically in my living room, I don't have 2,000 people. So you all have to be really quiet for a moment. Alexa. Ask Sonar how many people live nearby 201 4th Street Northeast, Washington, D.C. Sorry, I didn't understand. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Research. Ask Sonar how many people live nearby 201 4th Street Northeast, Washington, D.C. There are 889 neighbors living in 443 households within 200 meters. So I can leverage the geo-enrichment and census data through a voice interface. But I also want to tell the city things. Thanks, that was pretty cool. Let me show you one more demo, and then you, then you can clap. Shh, Alexa's listening. Alexa, ask Sonar, add note, dangerous intersection at 2nd and Constitution Northeast, Washington, DC. There are 585 uh, neighbors living in 263 households within 200 meters. Awesome. So um, when there are 2,000 people here, I can add a feedback even through Facebook. Add a note. That note will actually be captured. And then I actually want to see notes. Yep. So, one more time. Language, words are hard. So I can now explore this back through my GS, through a map interface of the notes that I and others have contributed to our town and our city. So I can see what I've said, what others said, and this is the way the city can listen to those neighbors about what's going on. Now, as in a research and development, this is all actually open source. You can go in and play with this and explore this yourself through our Ezra GitHub repository. So this is just one example project of something we're excited about in the future. But Mansoor is going to share actually another really awesome project that he's been working on. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> so Kuwait Finder is a mobile application built by the Public Authority for Civil Information, or PASI. And it connects Kuwait uh, citizen with Kuwaiti business for different services. It is actually built on the RJS platform. And one of the services that it provides is actually live traffic. And uh, it is actually for routing purposes. 
Now, uh, we're going to be, <clears throat> this live traffic is actually published as a web service. So we're going to be using the RGS uh, Python API that Rohit showed up earlier to actually connect to the PASI portal and actually see this live traffic in action in here. I love this map. It's beautiful. It's expressive. It's rendered very quickly. And they've spent a lot of time on symbolizing it and reflecting a lot of the information that's in there. But the information that you see in the traffic usually comes from sensors that are on the road or other mo monitors in there. And it is not always up to date or coming to us at the speed that we want. Or sometimes it's totally missing, which defeats the purpose of actually having a real-time traffic in there. So PASI is engaging in a project using machine learning to actually complement this missing data. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why are they using machine learning for this process in there? That is because in machine learning, you do not have to explicitly program the conditions for traffic, like where time of day it is, what day of the week it is, what the road conditions. The model figures it out automatically for us. And we're doing that using supervised learning to fill in the gaps in there. Now, once the data is showing up and it's looking very good, we need to explore how the model is working and is it giving us the information that we need. And for that, we're using the JavaScript API with its new advanced technologies to be able to render massive amount of data and animate it. So what I want to show you here is our solution to show this information in action. And this is a model that we bring in. And now we can replay the data as it comes in. By the way, this is a real model coming in. Look how powerful and look how fast the JavaScript application is reflecting this. And of course, I can put it in 3D to show all this information. And this is pretty cool and very impressive. I can turn it into a mesh, what you call it, a mesh map, show the different ideas, and gives me a way of seeing that the model, the machine learning model, is actually doing what it's supposed to do. That's pretty cool. And I think you guys can do that too, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I have a session tomorrow about this, by the way. I know it's a shameless plug. I love you guys to come to it. Thank you, and I'll give it back to you, to Jim. We love you too, Mansoor. Love you more. <laughs> so that concludes our second section of the plenary. Um, we're a few minutes late. I apologize for that, so I'll be brief. Uh, in closing, our goal this morning was to give you a comprehensive overview of ArcGIS so that you could have the information that you need to understand where to invest your time this week uh, in the heart of the Dev Summit, which is the tech sessions, and, and obviously give you a broader overview as well. Every, you, everyone that you've seen this morning uh, has their fingerprints on some aspect of our products at some level. Um, we've got folks from all of our development centers here this week with our folks from Redlands. It's going to be a fantastic week um, to collaborate with you. On behalf of all of us that presented and the hundreds of team members that they represent um, back in their respective uh, offices, we want to thank you for allowing us to give you an update on our work. And we hope that our work will become useful in your work. So go build something awesome. That's the end of our plenary session. Let's get some lunch. Thank you.